everybody. Um, welcome to our 10th lecture in the series. Um, this one's called Coping With Your First On Call. Um, so this is going to be done by Alice and I. We're both on the NSTS committee and we're both currently F2s. Um, we both graduated from Leeds University together and I'm still working in Leeds and Alice is working in London. Um, due to COVID, I've actually spent eight months last year of last year covering surgical wards on call. So I felt like this is a good opportunity for us to share some knowledge the things that we wish we knew before we started um, and hopefully we can keep this interactive and answer any questions or worries that you have um, about starting F1 um, especially in relation to your surgical jobs. Um, hopefully we can eliminate any worries um, and feel free to ask questions as we go along and um, but also we've got our emails at the end if you've got anything that you want to ask us from there. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Alice. Um, as Jen said, we train together. I'm working in London. So today we're going to go through some common bleeps that you'll all come across when you're out of hours. A bit of essential prescribing, a bit about how to escalate. Throughout the whole talk, we're going to give you top tips. We've tried to keep everything for, from the National Surgical Teaching Society nice and practical. Um, as we go along, as Jen said, just put questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring it as well. And at the end, if there's any more questions, we can go through those then. Fantastic. So without further ado, we'll start with um, you all imagining that you're on your first night shift of FY1 and you've started off with covering the surgical wards um, and you get a bleep and on the other end of the phone it says doctor, this patient in cubicle three has a blood pressure of 80 over 50 um, and immediately I think the most common thing to do is panic. Um, so I think um, this is a very, very common bleep that you can get and um, people tend to often be hypotensive, um, especially post-operatively. Um, so I think even when you're speaking on the phone, um, the first thing you can do is say, I'm coming straight away, but also you can ask a few questions to help prepare yourself and prepare the patient on your way there. Um, so firstly, you can ask the nurse, how do they look? Um, if, you're, um, if they look unwell, you're obviously going to prioritise that bleep and get there as soon as possible and you're thinking right I'm going to do an A to E to assessment to try and work out the cause why they're hypotensive if they're hemodynamically unstable and on the phone you might want to know their other observations what their news call may be things like their heart rate and the temperature to help you work out why also on your way there if you think that this is going to be something that you're going to struggle to manage with independently this might be a great opportunity to escalate or seek support from people around if you're sitting in a surgical assessment unit however on the other side um, these patients might be really well um, and so a really good question to ask when you first get told about a patient who's got a low blood pressure is if they're alert what's their gcs oops going ahead what's their GCS what's their AVPU and um, are they talking to you are they looking well and um, because if so you can think about things like their urine output because even if they've got a very low blood pressure if they're producing urine it's generally a sign that they're well perfused and the kidneys are working um, and so it's something that you don't need to worry about as much and um, you might want to know if they already have fluids prescribed and um, because even if they look well or unwell it might, you might want to think about get, giving the patient a bolus and um, if they've already got got fluids running um, to, to help their blood pressure. And also you might want to know what it was before. Um, so very commonly you can get bleeped about a low blood pressure, but actually this is what the patient has been sitting at for the last 24 hours. Um, and it might just be that there's been a change of shift. So someone's just come on and they're now very concerned. So it's good to have an idea of the trend of things um, to look at before you get too worried. This is my thought process or um, flow chart. Um, but realistically, this is a time where you might want to think about somebody's fluids and why they are having a low blood pressure. So this is the official chart that you want to potentially get into your head. Um, it's a really good, it's a really good idea to get into good habits with fluid prescribing. Um, and this is the nice guidelines, the nice algorithm um, that you should become familiar with. Um, two main things obviously if you're worried and the patient is unwell you're going to go down this resuscitation route and um, this red part here and um, but the main things that i want to highlight to your attention is assessing the patient's likely fluid and electrolyte needs so that's in terms of getting into the pattern of doing um, a fluid assessment taking a history doing a clinical examination and um, thinking about their fluid balance their input and output and any recent bloods they've had it's also this um, first blue box here 
it's a really good um, useful tool when you're giving maintenance fluids and um, you can easily fall into bad habits of prescribing kind of random one-off bags of plasma lights or Hartman solution but actually um, if they're on maintenance fluid it's a really good idea to know how much their daily requirements are however um, there's a reason why it is um, thought that surgical F1s are renowned for all they really do at work is prescribe fluids because it's really common that you get a bleep to just prescribe a bag of one-off fluids. So good things to keep in your mind are why you're prescribing fluids and why that patient is on fluids, how they need to take on fluids, whether that's IV or oral and the speed at which they need them and what sorts of fluids you need to be prescribing. I know that this is something that I felt like um, doctors that I was speaking to would just know and at medical school I wasn't I was a bit more unsure about how this would fall into my day-to-day -day practice so these are probably my top tips to keep in mind when you're prescribing. It is true that every hospital has its own normal um, and habitual fluids that nurses might expect you to just prescribe um, but it's really important to try and maintain as good habits as possible and if they are on maintenance fluids it's good for your um, friends on your night shift or on call if you've prescribed you know that patient and you've prescribed fluids for 24 hours because it avoids them getting a bleep in the middle of the night just saying the patient's bag of fluids has run out can you prescribe something else when they don't know why they may need them um, always important to keep a strict input and output um, and things like if the patient has um, a low urine output or a high output stoma um, that can change what you might prescribe just to note that if the patient does have a high output stoma, um, it's important to make sure you prescribe maintenance, flu maintenance fluids with potassium if, if that's required, but also they will need replacement um, potassium to also make sure that they are retaining. So uh, your bleep goes off again. Doctor, patient in B4 has a temperature. Can you please come and see them? So whilst you're on the phone, Jen. Oh, the slides. <laughs> uh, so whilst you're on the phone, firstly, ask the nurse, what is the temperature? Because um, some nurses will ring you of temperature of 36 and obviously it's not temperature. So clarify it's the temperature, but do be aware that elderly patients can mount a really low grade temperature um, and still be fairly unwell. So worth checking what the patient looks like, as Jen was saying, thinking it through. You can ask the nurse what the rest of their OBS are. So either they'll give you a handover or if you're lucky enough to have online notes um, at your hospital, you can get the patient's hospital number, type it in, and then you can see their OBS and their trends. So you've clarified this is a temperature. It's likely that your bleep is going off again already. So just a tip for saving time. If you say to the nurse, OK, I'm on my way. Please, could you find me a blood culture giving set or blood bottles? just so when I come over, I can do it and it'll save you time whilst you're on call. So two things could happen when you go to see this patient. So patient B4, so scenario A is a 65 year old male. He's two days post-op for a perforated ulcer. You read his notes from the morning ward round. You notice that they already suspected he'd developed a chest infection. He's been started on antibiotics. He's had one dose say. At the end of the bed, he looks a bit sweaty. Temperature's 37.6 but otherwise his OBS are pretty stable. Um, the other situation that could happen is you can turn up and this patient, 65 year old male, seven days post the same operation. At the end of the bed, he looks absolutely horrendous. His temperature is 38 and you can tell he's already starting to deteriorate. His BP's dropped um, and he's starting to become tachycardic. So although these are two different patients, your management for them technically should be the same kind of approach. So obviously scenario A, this patient's had one dose of antibiotics. The home team think they have an infection. Um, they think that they've identified the correct source. So his temperature is probably completely appropriate and he's been started on some treatment. It is still worth listening to his chest, heart, having a feel of his abdomen, checking his surgical site just to check nothing's been missed. In this scenario, if the patient had had three to four doses of his antibiotics, they sh probably shouldn't still be spiking temperatures. So either their antibiotics need review or the cause of the temperature needs review. So on the other hand, scenario B, this patient, of course, is septic. So you're thinking about your sepsis six or where me and Jen were, we did Buffalo. So Buffalo, obviously, you all know what it stands for, blood cultures, urine output, fluids, antibiotics, lactate, oxygen. This patient's sick, so you're going to be letting your, super, uh, your senior know about them, but 
you should be confident in yourself. Every single one of you as an FY1 doctor should be able to initiate all these things independently. You prove yourself to be an excellent FY1 if you've at least started to initiate these things when you ring your reg. Otherwise, you ring your reg, you say, I think I've got a septic patient here. These are the things they're gonna tell you to do. So if you've started them, um, that's you're already proving yourself to be a better F1. So as I've mentioned, culture bottles can be really hard to find. So it does save you time if you can get a nurse to find you some. If you're taking blood cultures, you might as well take a full set of bloods if you can. And a VBG is the quickest way you can get a lactate for a patient. If they're not struggling to breathe, it's a bit mean to be giving a patient an ABG at this stage, I think. If they're really unwell, then an ABG might be warranted. Um, as well, when you take the VBG, the bloods, you might as well send a full set of bloods to the lab and you can send a formal lactate as well in case something happens to your VBG while you're running to the machine. Um, but septic patients can sometimes be difficult to bleed. So the most important test you get out of your, temp your patient with a temperature is a blood culture. If the SATs are fine, you don't really need oxygen unless you think they're really sick. And then the guidelines are critically unwell patients are on 15 liters, whatever. Um, in terms of the patient who spiked whilst on the antibiotics, I would still try and get bloods and a blood culture from them. There's some debate about usefulness of a blood culture if the patient's already started on antibiotics. However, if, for example, this patient in scenario A, you, you thought their temperature it wasn't concerning, it was completely appropriate, they had a temperature, they've got an infection. If, however, they're still spiking in the morning when the day team come back, it's useful for them to see that you've documented, reviewed and sent some blood tests so they can keep an eye. So thinking about our post-op pyrexia, this is an image we used in our post-op lecture a few weeks ago. It's just a useful way of thinking about everything. When you're all the on-call F1, it's probably going to be an infection because if they spike a temperature quickly, that'll be the most common reason for it but just when you're on the board, it is important to remember in the back of your head that there can be other things that cause it. But in the post-op patient, it's usually a, an infection. So just a quick note on antibiotics. Um, so there's no point in me listing antibiotics for you all because it'll change depending on your trusts and what bugs are coming in your area. But most important thing is to just be, when you're on call, be as safe as possible always safe and common sense and trust your cl clinical judgment. When you're on call reviewing a patient that is not known to you, it's so important to have a methodical way of going through things. If you use your A to E, regardless of how sick they are, follow the guidelines and then escalate when you've reached the extent of your comfort zone, you, you can't go wrong. I'm just gonna mention here, cause I didn't find out about this until quite late, um, the induction app, which you should definitely all download All the numbers in your in your um, phone so you can look up the microbiologist on call um, and just ring them straight from your phone or the radiologist whoever you need um, this is also really useful if you're walking around the hospital and you get a bleep you can type the number in and just call it straight from your phone as opposed to waiting um, until you can find a phone and then over to the next bleep so um, another really common bleep that you get is just being asked to prescribe anything and everything. Um, often you, as you're on call, you won't know the patients um, and often you get asked to prescribe drugs by name, sometimes ones that you've not heard of. Um, so it's really important. This is just here as a reminder, especially with remote prescribing, um, to be really wary with what you're prescribing and why. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about things that you're often asked to prescribe as a surgical F1. They tend to be mainly analgesia, laxatives and antiemetics. Um, but especially when you're busy, it can be really tempting to just find the nearest computer and put something on emeds. Um, but actually knowing why the patient's having the symptoms can be vital um, and it's actually your duty to go and have a look at them and if you're ever in doubt just to examine them. Um, so I think the first thing that I'm going to talk about is pain relief. If um, you're being asked to prescribe some analgesia it's important to know why exactly the patient's in pain and um, particularly if this is new pain uh, you might want to know what's causing that. Um, it's very common that um, after an operation, anaesthetists can kindly write up PRN medications for the patients coming out of theatre. Um, it's 
often um, good if you can, if you're being asked to prescribe analgesia, just have a look on what is on their drug chart already. You want to know what this patients already have just to make sure that what you're prescribing is safe. Um, sometimes with PRN medications, a good tip is that um, it doesn't always check what's been had in 48 hours. So you should try and check doses, especially things like paracetamol, so you don't go over the limit. Um, often it's also a good tip to just prescribe things regularly because that means that nurses will offer patients um, and it just prompts them to offer things regularly to make sure that they've got their pain under control. It's so important to have adequate pain relief, especially post-operatively, um, because as you can imagine, especially with general surgical patients, they can have quite severe abdominal pain and it really hurts um, to take a big deep breath in or to cough. Um, and that can give rise to lots of post-operative um, uh, chest infections, atelectasis um, and hinders their physio and delays their discharge really. So having good pain relief immediately does really help these patients. Another really common phrase that gets thrown around that I had absolutely no idea what it was before I started work was PCA. Um, you get thrust a form and say, doctor, can you sign off this PCA for this patient? You have a look and I just saw it was morphine and I thought, oh, I'm not sure what I'm doing. Um, but that's actually patient controlled analgesia. A lot of the time these patients come back from um, or step down after their operation and they just have a click, which means that they can manage how much analgesia they're getting as and when. Um, it's just really important in these patients. There's often a box at the bottom of the form. Good to familiarise yourself with these forms when you're starting work. Um, and you can also prescribe some naloxone just on the off chance this patient, you're called to see them. They've got a very low respiratory rate, pinpoint pupils, and someone needs to suddenly go and grab some naloxone. Um, it doesn't happen often, but good to be aware that um, of what these patients' medications are, if that's what you're called to. I'm just going to really briefly um, reiterate the importance of the WHO analgesic pain ladder as well. Um, it's something that's probably taught to you a time and time again at medical school. Um, this is just one that I briefly took from one of our medical school lectures. Paracetamol. Uh, you may think if someone's had a massive abdominal operation, how is paracetamol going to help? But actually, if you're referring somebody to the pain team, they're going to want to know what regular medication they're on, even this is paracetamol and cocotamol. Cocotamol is actually codeine and paracetamol, eight milligrams um, in 500 of paracetamol or 30, depending on their requirement. Often trusts just prescribe codeine straight off as well. You can do a range 30 to 60 milligrams, that's what was common in, in my trust, um, before escalating to morphine. Um, and often actually these, medic these medications such as paracetamol are basic but they're things that you can prescribe regularly, you can prescribe paracetamol orally or IV if the patient's nailed by mouth um, and this ha has an effect for the further pain medication that they're going to be on and really helps them to get on top of it um, so it's important. Oops, not letting go. Um, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is the delightful topic that you will know, um, there's no doubt that you will enjoy the delights of what comes in and out and this really sometimes is your bread and butter when you're on call and um, you're often asked to prescribe laxatives if a patient hasn't opened their bowels um, laxatives it's really important to check with your surgeon or know what this patient's regime is on and again as we've said before if you're unsure don't just prescribe go and examine the patient read their notes work out what's going on um, because often you, you, you basically don't want to do more harm. Um, if this patient is concentrated in requiring laxatives or hasn't opened their bowels for a number of days, it's really important to establish why. And um, the main things that we want to rule out is this next bullet point, whether they post-operatively got ileus or whether this is them pre presenting with a bowel obstruction. Um, something that I always forget is to check, even if they haven't opened their bowels, are they passing wind? Um, you know, that's basic checking, is something coming through or are they completely blocked off? Um, and that basically means that, do I need to escalate? Um, should I be going to examine this patient? Um, do I need to speak to my senior about them? Because if you're querying bowel obstruction or if this ileus is ongoing, um, this is something that you probably need to speak to somebody about, about how you're going to manage it further and whether to order an abdominal X-ray um, and speak to a more senior surgeon. 
Um, I've just done a bit of revision here as well. Often with laxatives, it's important to know how things work um, and it's easy to forget, especially when things have, have trade names. Um, so um, sometimes if people are in bowel obstruction or you wor you're worried about the motility of the bowel, um, you want to avoid stimulants and go for something more like a softener. I've also just finally on laxatives, I could talk about it all day, but I've just talked about enemas and bowel prep. So again, this is something you might be expected to prescribe. Um, enemas, I didn't realize before starting work, they come as almost like little pellets. And um, so you can get glycerol enemas, which um, are kind of more gentle if you're trying to clear the bowel, or you can get phosphate enemas, which do a lot more damage. Um, and you also might want to check patients electrolytes and things prior to that. Um, they just um, can be inserted. Normally nurses kindly do these fantastic surgical nurses, but also if you're going to PR a patient that might need then need an enema, um, the nurses will absolutely love you if you take one with you and then you can do it all at the same time. For bowel prep prior to colonoscopies um, or any investigations, it's just worth double checking what your trust guidelines are for the bowel prep there and how um, how much time beforehand before their procedure they need to have it done because otherwise this can cause um you know think delays basically before they get this done on that note jen um yeah. just a question in the chat if it sounds like obstruction for yeah. example if a nurse calls you over the phone and it sounds urgent would you call your senior first or would you go and examine them i would go and examine the patient first um if you call your senior the first thing they're going to ask you is what the patient looks like. Are they well? Um, and you as a doctor, you can go, you can do that initial A to E assessment um, before you, it's much more easier to speak to your senior once you've seen them, once you know what you're dealing with um, and also can alleviate your own worries if it is something that you can sort out yourself. Um, you should never be afraid to escalate, but I think definitely go and see the patient first just so that you know. If you get to them and they look incredibly unwell, your first step, can be to immediately escalate and then while they're getting there you can finish the rest of your exam um but um i think definitely go and examine them first okay does that answer the question the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know um so again with keeping on my delightful theme of what comes out um if you're asked to come and prescribe a patient antiemetics it's so common um doctor this patient's vomiting they keep vomiting can you prescribe me some anti-sickness medication and it's very easy to just think, yeah, of course, can pop that on emeds. But actually, you really want to know why is this patient feeling sick? Why are they being sick? Um, you want to check what the patient's eating if they're nil by mouth. Um, and you really want to get into some more detail and know what does this sick look like? Um, it's so common on a surgical job, especially dealing with patients with bowel obstruction, um, that they have delightful bright green bilious vomiting um, and that is um, it can sometimes be feculent as well once you smelt it you'll never go back um, and these patients will require um, some often some conservative management before they can get a scan or before they can go to theatre um, and that does tend to be what we called at university drip and suck and um, does what it says on the tin and um, you want to give these patients IV fluids if they're vomiting a lot um, and you also want to get out the content that's building on the abdomen so these patients often present haven't passed any flatus, haven't opened their bowels, large distended abdomen, vomiting copious amounts of bilious green sometimes speculant vomit. These patients you will be expected to probably put a RAS tube in and suction off with a syringe as much as you can and then keep this NG, uh, it's like an NG tube but it's a RAS tube, it's a bit thicker um, and you can't feed from it and that stays in and that's a conservative management of a bowel obstruction. I um, think that when you start work it can sometimes be a bit of a daunting prospect to insert RAS tubes um, so always try and find someone, take somebody with you. Nurses may be able to do them, have another pair of hands, similar to a catheter. It's just always good to have a second pair of hands and try and watch one being done by your F2 or senior um, before you have to put one in and um, because it's just really useful to know. Good tip as well is always to get the patient to have some water. Um, even if they're not nil by bath, you can get a straw, you can double check, but just to help them swallow it as it's going through. Um, often people worry with like similarly to NG tubes, how do you know if you're in the right place? 
you will know if you're in the right place by what's splurting out the other end. Yeah, you- it is good to have someone monitoring that other end because we had friends that have had to go and have a shower afterwards if no one's Absolutely. monitoring the other end. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I am... Um, also, but however, other than this, p- patients can just get sick often um, post-operatively. It's very common after anaesthetics, after anaesthetics medications, um, that patients just do feel um, a bit nauseous and vomit. Um, so uh, just quite a good reminder to remember the different causes of why you're sick. Um, less relevant in surgical cases, potentially a cerebral and vestibular causes. So vestibular being your dizzy patients, cerebral sometimes you're increasing intracranial pressure, but also those that are really anxious. Um, but mostly I think you um, experience patients that are toxic either post-operatively um, or having kind of gastric sickness. With your toxic patients on Danzatron is a fant- fantastic antiemetic um, that helps with post-operative nausea. Um, and also cyclazine is a good one as well um, that helps. So often patients on surgical wards will have ondansetron or cyclazine that can be given. Just to note, I didn't realise that cyclazine IV can be addictive and some patients absolutely love it. Um, so again, just that's a good point to have. Gastric causes of vomiting. Um, also, you just want to watch out for those with reflux or gastritis. And actually, in those cases, a PPI might be more appropriate to manage their nausea. Oh, I did some arrows, just forgot. (laughs) Okay, our our final bleep is, um, doctor, the patient in C3 is not breathing very well. Can you come and look at her? So this is always a worrying one to come across, I used to find, um, because it doesn't necessarily mean that the nurse has done a set of obs. They, They actually think that this patient looks sick and that's why they're ringing you. So this patient is a, Jen? Oops, sorry. She's a 35 year old female, 24 hours post-op, uh, struggling to breathe and complaining of chest pain. So she already looks sick. So you start your A2E assessment. Airways patent because she's speaking in short sentences to you. But, but I mean, you can tell that she doesn't look good at all. Her respiratory rate is 40. Some helpful nurse has already put 15 litres on her and she's only saturating 94%, which is bad. Um, she's got some crackles in her right lung base otherwise warm and well perfused, but you can see that she's already starting to decompensate in other ways. So she's becoming hypotensive, she's becoming tachycardic. So you're immediately worried about this patient. Um, Patients cannot fake having low saturations unless they've lost circulation to their fingers. So just for the rest of it, GCS 1515, abdo soft known tender, surgical site looks all right, no rashes, calf soft known tender. So what are your differentials? I'll just give you a couple of seconds. I'm sure you can all think of some brilliant differentials, write them down, text your friends. <laughs> okay, that's long enough. So these should be the kind of differentials you're thinking of. What I want to make the point of, so you're starting to think of these differentials in your head as you're doing your A to E. I'm sure you all thought of every single one of these, but the important thing in this scenario is this patient is really sick and they need stabilizing and you're already starting to think about escalating. So as we mentioned earlier, you've come to look at them, you're already thinking I need to get help here. With these observations that we saw in the A to E, you'd be completely correct to put out a medical emergency call straight away. Um, So for your initial management, you've done your A to E assessment, oxygen's on. The next most important thing is to get your ABG. So it is worth knowing where the ABG machine is in your hospital depending on, we had different on calls, which would be covering different wards in different hospitals, and there'll be different ABG machines that are closer, depending on where you are. You're also, even if you're thinking of pulmonary embolus, you need to get a portable chest X-ray for this patient. This patient is unwell. When the radiographer asks you, can they come to the department? The answer is no. So this is the induction app again. I just took a screenshot of my hospital. So you just search for X-ray and you ring the x-ray department and say can you come and do a portable chest x-ray you can get your nurses to start setting up the um, ecg hopefully post-op patient most of them will have iv access already but they're going to need a new set of bloods as well to send off Uh, lactate again you can do the lactate will come on your abg actually if you're querying a pe and the surgeon's concerned um you do that sometimes they say ctpa but i think most trusts you'll need a chest x-ray first even if it's um a clear chest x-ray so in the acutely 
desaturating patient. Next slide. Um, so get your ABG early and order that portable chest X-ray. And then if they're unstable, as this patient obviously is, um, low threshold to put out a MET call. I'll come on to what MET calls are if some of you aren't aware. Um, if you're putting out the MET call, which is a medical emergency call where it'll bring you a load of help, it's worth while you're waiting for help to come just to get the patient's notes up, which is easy when they have paper notes. But sometimes if your hospital has e-notes, you might need to log on to a computer nearby and start having a look through their notes. You might want to start considering the past medical history of the patient. Do they have asthma, COPD? Do they have any risk factors for a clot? Obviously, if it's a surgical patient, that's already a risk factor. Um, was their VTE stopped before surgery? Has it not been restarted? If um, you're, su you're suspecting a PE and you're ordering, you've got this chest X-ray, it's clear, and you're going to order a CTPA, this will need requesting and betting, which I'll come on to. But the important thing is you will need to start the patient on treatment for a PE before you get the result of the CTPA. So usually tins of par in 1.5 mg per kg or whatever it is on your um, trust guidelines. You don't initiate this by yourself. You need a senior to help you just because there's contraindications for it. But lots of your seniors, surgical regs, they will think, oh, let's get the CTPA first. No, you, if you're suspecting this is a PE, especially with the patient being unstable, you should be putting them on tinsaparin already. Some contraindications are people with end-stage renal disease. So if their creatinine clearance is less than 15, obviously if they're actively having a major hemorrhage um, and or they have conditions with increased bleeding risk. So in order to get that CTPA, this is something I didn't realize um, before I started work. I thought just chest x-rays happened when you asked them, someone to do them. So they're just not as simple as it seems. You need to have scans vetted by a radiologist. Um, in some hospitals, some scans don't need vetting. So it's worth knowing which ones these are. So in St. Mary's where I worked, um, chest X-rays and CT heads don't need vetting by a radio radiologist. So the radiographers, so the radiographer is the person who does the scan. The radiologist is the doctor who reports the scan. Radiographers aren't doctors. It's, you get your head around it. Um, so things like portable chest x-ray you can ring the radiographer straight away so it doesn't you saving yourself an extra call to the radiologist other scans need to be approved by a radiologist firstly because those that is the person who's going to interpret and report your scan for you so they need to know a bit about the patient and what you're looking for to help them interpret this scan when you ring them they might actually suggest a more appropriate scan for the patient so they are useful to ring just a top tip for not out of hours if you're on a ward round and your consultant goes this patient needs a CT angio or an MRI brain and walks on to the next patient. You are the person who's going to be trying to order that scan later in the day. And radiologists are not pushovers. And if you do not put enough clinical details on a request, they will reject it. Um, so if you're unsure on a ward round why your consultant is asking for a scan, you, you can ask them, you can go, oh, what are we looking for here? Or why wouldn't we do this scan if you want to be polite? And then they will tell you because when your consultant disappears, to go to surgery for the rest of the day, you ring the radiologist, the request for my consultant asked me to order it really does not fly. Um, so then the final thing you'll need to do is ring the x-ray department um, and make sure you can book your patient in. So I mentioned the medical emergency calls. So most of you should be aware of the 2222 call. If you get, you can call a 2222 call and that is the cardiac arrest call. That is when a patient's completely deteriorated peri-arrest. That will bring you an anaesthetist, the medical on-call team and critical care outreach team, which are a team of specialized nurses that are linked to ITU and they often roam the hospital and they're always very useful and willing to help. The medical emergency team are the same as the 2222 team. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> um, but it doesn't bring you an anaesthetist. So if you're worried about a patient's airway, um, for example, if it's a patient having anaphylaxis, you don't think they're having a cardiac arrest, but you're worried about the airway, you need to do the 2222 call anyway. Um, alternatively, if you're just panicking and it's your first shift, just pull the patient's buzzer out of the wall and people will come running and someone will help you. Um, if 
it's not an emergency situation it's just urgent um, obviously if it's a surgical patient the first port of call is you speak to the surgical registrar on call if they're in theatre or unavailable you speak to the med reg on call or you can call the critical care outreach team for advice they're really useful if it's less urgent there's you're always going to have an SHO somewhere or an F2 you know in the hospital um, or you can email me and Jen um, so someone will be able to help you figure out how to escalate something. Um, so as much as we've said and touched on that you should feel confident to initi initiate resuscitation in an unwell patient, your seniors will want to know a patient's deteriorating before they are peri-arrest, because that's when they get annoyed when they get called late. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk about a little bit of advice um, in terms of ward rounds. So these are notoriously fast um, and pinning a consultant down when you're on a ward round in order to get all the information you need out to then be able to carry out your jobs for the day is sometimes more of a challenge than actually carrying out your jobs, would you believe. Um, so I just had this, um, one of the F1s that I was shadowing when I was at medical school that taught me this acronym um, and it came in handy so often on surgical ward rounds just to know what I needed to ask the consultant if he'd already seen the patient and I wasn't sure um, what the plan was. So the first thing that I'd recommend is if you have time to just really quickly prep the notes. Um, so it's good practice to always put the date and the time and um, the consultant's name at the top of the uh, at the top of the paper or the um, if you're online where you're writing. This can sometimes be easier said than done. If you don't know the name of the consultant that you're with, ask them and ask them to spell it out for you and just write it on the top of your handover sheet because then you will know it for the rest of the day. <laughs> um, and it's, it sounds funny, but honestly, you otherwise you just feel really silly all day. Um, so then I always tend to write a little triangle, which means diagnosis, if you have one, um, or what they were admitted with. Uh, whatever's brought this patient into hospital. If they've had an op operation, it's really useful to state the name of the operation and how many days they are post-operatively, because um, that's always really useful information, especially when the consultant who's done the operation turns around and asks you what day op this is, they just expect you to know. Um, my SOAP acronym, or this SOAP acronym, just stands for Subjective, Objective, Assessment and Plan. So um, first thing you can do is, how is the patient? When you go into the ward and see the patient, what is their opinion of how they're doing? Are they in pain? Have they opened their bowels? Are they feeling sick? And you can just scribble a few lines down. Objectively, how do they look to you? Are they sitting up? Do they look well? Um, if, they, if you've got any new scores of how their observations are, this is the place to just jot down um, anything that you're worried about or um, that you can observe just so that there's some evidence that you've seen the patient and that you, you've kind of carried, carried out that end of the bed assessment. Then often it will be the surgeon or one of your seniors who will examine the patient and um, sometimes they don't speak aloud as they're doing it so especially um, it's key if they're examining the wound site or the abdomen just to scribble down whether um, it's soft, what they felt and if they don't speak out loud and um, feel confident enough to ask what are the findings of your examination just so that you know what to write. Um, then with your plan Often people bullet point in numbers, so it's easy for your colleagues to read. And um, if the surgeon wishes for fluids or antibiotics, um, as much as you po uh, it's possible to, it's sometimes not always possible to carry a computer around with you as you go through the ward round, um, but try and check the drug, drug chart, try and work out that what they're already on, establish for how long um, and how they want to give the antibiotics. Because often if they just say, oh, give X, Y, and Z, then you, then you go away to prescribe and you need to know how long the course is, whether that's oral or IV, um, do, you want, do you want them on, um, on this for however many long, however long, you get my gist. Um, other things that nurses will often ask you is if the patient is, can they eat and drink? Um, so a good thing to check with the surgeon is, are they now nil by mouth? Um, which is what NBM stands for um, and what's acceptable for the patient to trial if they're trialing different diets. Again, as Alice said, if they say, get a CT abdo pelvis or request an ultrasound scan, um, as, as well as writing it down in the plan, and um, just ask why and how urgently do they need that? Do they want that scan by the end of the day? Do they want that scan in the next hour? Or is this something that they're happy, happy to have over the next 48 hours? Um, and then finally, if they're happily telling this patient that they can go home, um, really important as it will be you that's writing the discharge letter, um, they just want to check 
if there's any medications they want that patient to go home with, if they need follow up um, and how long afterwards, and also if there's any other questions that the patient has about their discharge um, that can be answered by the consultant because often you won't know. Um, so that's just a really good few things to keep in your mind when you're on the ward round, just to make your life that bit easier than running around trying to find a surgeon or anyone that can help you afterwards. Okay, so for the out of hour shift, um, I'm sure Jen thought this as well. I, I thought when I was going to be out of hours on call, I was going to be running around from cardiac arrest to cardiac arrest, and it was all going to be really exciting. But realistically, the vast majority of out of hours is you chasing stuff that didn't happen in the daytime. So at the beginning, say you're doing a late shift, your, your day kind of, you've done your normal day shift till five, then all your fellow F1 friends want to go home at five and you're in charge of the hospital suddenly until 10 p.m., whatever. So at the beginning of your shift, your bleep starts going and it's your colleagues trying to hand over jobs to you that haven't happened in the day. Also, the nurses start bleeping you because they know that they can get hold of you for cannulas and all sorts. So you do get better at deciding, like prioritizing as you go. Um, but that's something you do kind of need to pick up on the job. Um, when a patient, when a fellow F1 hands over to you, a handover is, I mean, it's really important. It's transferring responsibility and accountability of some or all aspects of care of a patient over to you. Um, and it needs to be safe. You need to make sure you're asking the questions and you're clear what you need to do. Um, some of these jobs can be really boring. It can go, oh, this patient's full blood count didn't come back today. Oh, they haven't had this scan reported. Um, can you chase it out of hours? So you often get taught how to give a good handover at med school, but when you're taking the handover for your on-call shift, the onus is on you because you're accepting it. Care's transferring to you. Do not be afraid of calling out your colleagues on a bad handover because if they go home, you're the one dealing with it. So for example, one of your colleagues goes, oh, Alice, his full blood count came back today. It looked fine, but can you just chase, chase his user knees? Okay, what do you want me to do if this is the result? Make sure that they have a plan. So, I mean, obviously if the potassium comes back really high, you're just gonna treat them for hyperkalemia, et cetera. But it's, if a patient's already unwell, they go, oh yeah, his, his inflammatory markers are definitely going down. You can just chase them. If they come back and they have gone up, if you haven't asked them, please can you put an antibiotic plan in the notes for if these um, inflammatory markers have got worse? Because it'll save you ring, ringing the microbiologist out of hours if they've already written down, if inflammatory markers worsening, start patient on tazacin. Um, That's just one example. Some scans out of hours, if someone hands over a x-ray elbow, trust me, that's not happening till nine o'clock the next morning because your patient who needs a CTPA is in the way. Um, so just some things that I would like to caveat this with, if you're quiet, it's always nice to be helpful to the nurses and do what you can, but this is when you're really busy. I used to get filled with dread to be called for a cannula, quite frankly, when I start, started work. So knowing which cannulas are essential and you need to go and do are stuff like anti-epileptics, IV antibiotics, unless they've been on IV antibiotics for about 10 days and they need changing to orals. Families asking for updates about patients you know nothing about really shouldn't be you. Um, the nurses can often talk to them and say, look, it's better if you speak to the day team. If some patients, um, families can get quite um, really wanting to speak to a doctor. So then you'll just need to go and say, look, I don't know anything about this patient. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to wait till the day team tomorrow. Um, also similar with discharge summaries about patients you don't know, you shouldn't be writing these and it's up to your fellow F1 colleagues. They should be prepping these. Um, sometimes things can change on the weekend so that's the only time I would say maybe you can finish off a discharge summary but most of the stuff should be prepped for you um, and as I mentioned about chasing scans unlikely to happen or that won't change management overnight um, if a patient is suspected to have a fracture of their elbow they're probably going to be in a cast already if it's not been reported if then if it's not going to change something overnight then you shouldn't be doing it essentially and you should be prioritizing important urgent jobs and I think that's one of the hardest things about starting is knowing what those are. On that note, we'll come to our final part. Um, so this is just to say that um, probably until you start the job, I definitely found, and people said it to me and it's frustrating, but until you start the job, you just don't know 
what's going to be involved with you because it changes trust to trust and until you it takes a few weeks to get into it and um, you don't know the people that you're working with um, and it can feel taunting but we just want to reiterate that as much as you may feel it when you start out you will soon realize you're absolutely never alone it's the best thing about working in a hospital and um, there is always a team of people looking after that patient and that goes for um, you when you're out of hours but also there's always going to be a doctor there so even when you leave the hospital there's always somebody taking over from you um, which is a really important if your seniors are in theatre or busy clerking in another patient, um, it's also important to use people that are around you. Surgical nurses can be absolutely fantastic. Um, they can often do catheters, as Alice said, they can often do cannulas. Um, they are so experienced in terms of managing wounds and dressings. And that's something that as medical students, we often don't have a lot of experience with. So if you're ever unsure what you're looking at, grab one of the nurses that's looking after that patient and just ask them to talk you through it. Don't be afraid to ask for help um, from your nurses as well. Um, the med reg is a saviour. Um, you as an F1 are often covering the wards and your reg and your SHO is in SAU. Um, so often it's always good practice to escalate through your own team first, as Alice has mentioned, but the med reg um, have an S bar. I often just scribble S B A R on a piece of paper of a patient that I'm talking so if I'm calling in a panic I just have the salient points that are needed when I'm speaking to the med reg and they will often come and have a look at those patients and um, many hospital trusts have hospital at night it's worth establishing if your trust does when you start work and um, because you can get clinical support for things like cannulas and bloods out of hours don't ever feel pressured into prescribing something that you've never heard of there's always pharmacists to speak to and as Alice said, especially with antibiotics and antimicrobial prescribing, your microbiology, um, there's, even if they're out of hours, there's somebody on call and if you're desperate, you can ask for help. Um, radiology, we've touched over as well. They can also give you advice. So um, often a consultant may say, get this scan. And it's really important to know why, so that when the radiology says, actually, it might be more appropriate if you're looking for this, to get this sort of scan, and um, which can happen faster and be at less risk to the patient, especially things like if the patient does have a poor renal function, um, they might need a more, um, they might not be able to have contrast. So you might need to think around the box and seek advice from radiologists and even radiographers sometimes. Um, the final thing that I want to touch on is palliative care. Um, I think it's a big fear um, from speaking to other colleagues and other medical students about what you do if you feel like your patient is coming towards the end of your life and you're not getting support from your seniors, especially in a surgical job. Um, I'd say that there have been times out of hours when I seek advice from a palliative care consultant just to know what's appropriate. Um, and also I would reiterate that it's not your job ever as an F1 and even as a foundation year doctor to be making these sorts of decisions. And if you are worried that you are um, doing something that's against potentially what the best wishes of the patient and their family is, you should always um, feel that you can escalate that to your seniors um, and to the palliative care team if you really are concerned. And um, so that hopefully should be a reassuring slide to finish on that there are um, so many people around that are willing to help you and um, you just have to know where to find them and so on that note um, we come to the end and um, any questions we can now go through I think there's questions on the Q&A and also maybe on the yeah I think there's a couple of questions but feel free to email us as well everyone this is our feedback code I think um, one of our logistics team might post a link in the chat just so we know um, for both of us our learning if there's anything we could have done better um, we might be running it again, so anything you think that we could add next time. Uh, the first question I don't mind covering, uh, reference to the ABG, is there a portable machine to do this? Am I on the right wavelength, please? So this is the kind of thing that is key to know before you start. So when you do an ABG, um, obviously needle in the wrist, you then need to go, um, there is a there's about three machines in my hospital. One is in A&E recess. One is around the corner from A&E recess and one is in the respiratory ward. So you take your blood sample to this machine. You need the patient's hospital number. So if you get to the machine with the ABG needle without the patient's hospital number, 
you have to walk back to the patient as I have found out. <laughs> or you need to ring someone to give you the number and basically you pop the patient's hospital number in and a needle will stick out you stick your ABG needle in and that will be how it interprets the ABG for you and you'll get a result um, you need to make sure you get enough blood in the ABG um, thing otherwise it will clot the nurses will tell you off if you break the machine and they're down to two in the hospitals mm -hmm. um normally it's one in theaters as well which is hidden and oh, yeah. you can normally count on it itu as well yeah. maybe it's worth knowing where your nearest one is and you'll get training within your trust to get your passcode and things before you're able to so don't worry but it's just it's just it's a good thing to know where it is yeah, yeah. especially where you start, at least I reckon it's a it's uh, just learn these skills on the job. Um, so I would say you will all be competent FY1s. So I, I think there are certain things that you can do to help yourself and often it's managing your own fears so if you know you're particularly worried about putting a catheter in or cannulating a patient and you're you know you're just worried about those skills I think it's definitely good to go with F1s when you're on placement at medical school just to know what's required I wouldn't worry about them too much because you do them so often on your first on calls that they do become second nature and um, I think I started on long days and um, over the course of the, my 13 hour shift I was asked to put in over 20 cannulas and I only got one <laughs> so yeah, really. it just happens and you learn by I think yeah it's right skills wrong yeah. skills wise so I think the practical things of knowing who to go that's hopefully why we're giving this lecture is that things like who you can ask for help and having the induction app knowing where the gas machines are those are things that during your induction you can be a bit more savvy about so that when you start work you're not so left yeah, in the dark definitely i think the two most useful days i had um, we had a whole week of induction where i started and then the two days where i actually shadowed the current f1 were the most useful she just gave me the bleep and i did not know how it worked so no one none of our bleeps were answered yeah. for the first morning because she realized that i'd had the volume yeah. turned down so you do learn these kind of things yeah. on the job that it's just making yourself feel better about starting really um, and alleviating any anxieties because it is nerve-wracking yeah um, um who do we escalate to if you can't get a cannula or an abg so this is when you go to your f2 and this is when it's great being the f2 because there's no pressure for you to get it either but you're probably <laughs> just as likely to yeah um maybe. i would say give it two to three goes depending on how the patient is doing maybe less for an abg if you really don't think you're going to get it otherwise it gets quite mean to a patient if you've had three goes i think if you go to it's just confidence and if you go to your f2 and say look i've already had two goes um then they'll come with you have a look it might be worth trying somewhere else but there's someone who's always going to help you i think also knowing that there are other f1s in the hospital as well and um a lot of the time you can ask other people. I think a lot of the time as well, when you start off, when you feel like you're on your own, I think that's what over, over was an overriding feeling for me. Um, and actually just having somebody in with the patient with you to help you get into the right position, to help the patient get into the right position is so key. If you think you can't see your vein, get a nurse in with you just to help hold the arm or get a light in the right position or um, to have a look with you same with cannulas same with ngs and rods just have an extra pair of hands in the room with you and you'll be surprised at having that reassurance a bit of moral support help you. Yeah. moral support honestly also, okay. check the feet for cannulas yeah. there's often lovely veins in the foot there are but yeah with time any other okay. questions uh i don't know if there are any other questions in the feel other feel free to email us as well um if you've got anything else or if you anything from our slides that you want to know more about in more detail we just try to go over practicalities more than um knowledge but we're always happy to chat about anything else in terms of our jobs uh, we were going to mention if nobody logged into the urology lecture um that was one of the most practical and useful things um the catheters definitely going back and watch yeah. 
someone's asking if there are more of these sessions yes next week we have um a plastic surgeon from Bristol who's going to be giving us some tips and tricks um, on plastics. Week after is ENT, um, but there's a full timetable on our website. And these will all be recorded and put on our website as well. Um, so you can always refer back to this lecture if it's getting to the end of July next year and you want to go over some of these tips. Um, you can watch us from then. And we also have an MDT, um, which hopefully we can get a radiologist in to discuss more about requesting scans. So I think that's really, really important. And there's a one last question, job. Jen, that I definitely have been bleeped about a lot. Have you okay. been bleeped to prescribe sleeping pills? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, again, this falls under the category of prescribing things that you don't feel confident prescribing. Um, I am really reluctant to prescribe sleeping pills, partly because they should be used as a one off. Um, and also because, I mean, this is what somebody once told me, but they affect your circadian rhythm. And if you use them too often, especially in a hospital environment, they're less effective. You have all these little spiels that you can use. I think, um, uh, it's so tricky. I wouldn't prescribe more than it on a one-off occasion. And I'd be reluctant to prescribe them often when I yeah. start as an F1. If, yeah. you, if they know that you're going to be someone who prescribes sleeping pills as well, you often do four night shifts in a row. So you'll be bleeped every night about the same patient wanting the sleeping pill. One of my consultants told me once that um, sleeping pills don't actually give you any better quality of sleep. Uh, they just make you forget how bad your sleep was. And that's how it works. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's no. correct, but that's my consultant. Said. Um, I, um, so I think, yeah, I think there's also if you're worried about things like this or with prescribing or anything you can do no harm by following the guidelines asking a senior um leaving clear and logical notes so if you're ever unsure but you have a conversation with somebody or asked to do something document it mention what your action plan is and if you're not if you don't feel comfortable say no feel confident in saying no or say i'm going to go and ask somebody and no one will be angry at you for actually that's the safest thing often that you can do well, thank you everyone for tuning in. If everyone could just um, fill in that feedback form for us, because it's really useful for us to know how we can improve. And it's really good for mine and Jen's portfolios as well as a final plea. It only takes a couple of minutes. And we will hopefully see you all next week. Anything else to add, Jen? No, that's all. See you later. <laughs>